most of you have heard a lot of those messages. I mean, uh, pretty much have heard most of them um, that um, you know that are that, that that we've preached on those. And you know, it's interesting when some of these Bible movies come up. You know, these are, these are the times to really that I think it's it's. Uh, did the broadcast get started too? Okay, you you hit the green button on there. It said start. Okay, I'm just making sure you got that. Okay, because otherwise, Brother Finney's going to call me on the phone and be like, "What's going on?" Okay, good deal. You got it. Okay. Yeah, actually, it is prophetic. Actually, it is. Um, but um, but I want to talk to you about this movie, The Son of God. But I want to. Sh people say, "Well, what what's the big deal about this?" Well, this movie is being pushed by all of the new evangelicals. It's, it's being pushed by men like Joel Olstein. It's being pushed by Rick Warren. It's, it's being pushed by all of the heretics that are out there, all the New Age heretics that are out there, uh, the emergent church heretics that are out there. They're all pushing this, this movie for a reason. Now, so, yeah, well, see, that got me. What, what, when I heard that, I was like, man, I, I got to find out more about this Son of God movie. I've got to find out some more about who these people are. So I started digging. And I, I probably did it for like six or seven hours yesterday. I just kept digging and digging and digging in deeper and looking and looking and looking and figuring out what is the deal with this? And that got me digging into something else, which we'll talk about the next hour. And then, but but I, I kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And I was like, man, this just keeps coming. It just doesn't stop. This is, and you start to see what's really, what's going on. And now first what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, let's pray. Father, we need you, Lord. We pray you'd bless us. And Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 13. Uh, for such are false prophets, or false apostles, excuse me, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, we're going to add to this in a second here and give you some more scripture. But um, I want to read you, who, who, so who made this movie? Who put this movie together? Well, the same people that put this movie together are the same people that put the Bible series, the 11-hour Bible series, together that was on television. And what they did was they took the, the um, uh, clips and they edited things out and they put it kind of all together. And uh, that was an 11-hour series or whatever. So they put all those things together and, and that ended up being you know, uh, this movie, kind of, and then they probably added a few things, deleted a few things, and all that. You say, why is this so important? Well, it's very important because you've got churches, and we're going to get to it, that are that are renting out movie theaters to support this movie. So I got to thinking, why do all these people like this movie? Who are these people that are putting this out? So I want to read you who this lady is, first of all. This lady and her husband. Have you ever heard of that lady that, that made... That, that lady that she made a TV series. She was like the she was one of the. It was called Touched by an Angel. You know, it's more like Touched by a Devil. But uh, when when you figure out who this lady really is. But anyway, she was the Irish lady on there that was the angel or whatever. And uh, and, and that's who she is. Now I, I want to explain to you who this lady is because there's a satanic conspiracy behind all this. Just so you understand. And I do believe in conspiracies. You can think I'm kooky all you want to, but Psalm chapter 2 says that all the kingdoms of this world have conspired against Christ. They all have. And they're doing it now. And our battles are spiritual battles. So I look for what's the spiritual what is the spiritual conspiracy here? Why are they pushing this Jesus movie so much? Well, because there's a plan behind it. That's why. Now, what do you call someone who's a student of New Age psychology and spiritualism? Do you call them a New Ager? Do you call them seekers? Would you dare call them a Christian? Well, if you're Roma Downey, then yes, you would call yourself all of the above. This is an article that you can find. I'll give you the link to it if you want it later. But recently I was coming across one of the Christian channels and stumbled upon the Jim Baker Show. On the program, Jim and his wife, Lori, were hosting their special guests, Roma Downey and Mark Burnett, as well as a musical guest. It was such a weird mixture of evangelical mishmash that I was lured into watching the program myself to find out exactly what was going to happen. He said he wasn't disappointed. I sat and listened to Jim introduce his two guests, Downey and Burnett. 
I recalled their previous work on the History Channel's Bible, how they managed to literally rewrite the Bible itself, and they did, and presented another gospel message altogether. I was captured by their by Downey and Burnett's aggressive but subtle attempt to portray themselves as believers. The sappy spiritual love fest that per permeated on set showed me that something was indeed changing within Christianity, and that something was an, and that something was another Jesus being introduced to the masses. It needs to be understood by all who read this article that some facts need to be addressed. So she's going to go in, or he's going to go in and explain some some facts here. Roma Downey, a devout Roman Catholic, along with her husband, were heavily influenced by New Age spirituality. Downey graduated from the University of Santa Monica, a private graduated a private graduate school founded by New Age spiritual and self help guru John Roger, and will graduate with a master's degree in spiritual psychology. That would have been. Uh, in 2010. Roma went even further into her New Age Catholic spirituality by teaming up with acclaimed psychic John Edwards and co-produced a CD for children to be used for meditation and enlightenment. Those two words, meditation and enlightenment, are code words for the occult. Those are New Age words. Now, meditation on the Bible is right. Meditation on God and His Word is right. That's right. That's biblical. Understand that. It's very biblical. While Edwards, Edwards introduced the teachings of contacting the dead, in the book, Loyalty to Your Soul, The Heart of Spiritual Psychology, by H. Ronald Holnick, the New Age Roma Downey provides this glowing endorsement near the beginning of the book as follows. Now, I want you to understand something there. Now, you may think, well, this is not, come on, this is, do we really, why do we need to talk about this? It's not that big of a deal because there are millions of Christians out there that are supporting this. Millions. They are taking their churches and buying blocks. They're renting out the whole movie theater, each, every screen, and they're showing this movie. <clears throat> She says this, as a USM graduate, I know firsthand the value I received from participating with Ron and Mary in the master's degree program in spiritual psychology. Spiritual psychology, what a joke. I am so grateful to have loyalty to your soul to sweetly remind me of all I have learned. Let's just say that I went from playing an angel on TV to living more of an angelic life every day. The teachings in this beautiful book have sent me on a journey to, to the very center of my own being. We're wrapped in the safe wings of love. I feel as though I have come home. Are you listening to this? To the center of my own being. Do you know what that is? It's, it's, it's humanism wrapped up into, into uh, spiritism. It's the God within you. Not Jesus Christ, but the God, the New Age God that wants to rise up out of the abyss. Yeah, well, she hasn't. Watch. <laughs> Even further in regards to Mrs. Downey's position regarding spiritualism and her Catholic religion, Roma advocates the Eastern mysticism teachings of Eckhart Tolle. You probably don't know who that is. They're devilish. Another spiritual giant in the field of New Age teachings, not to mention the connections Tolle with, has with Oprah Winfrey, who is the high priestess of the New Order. Mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey is a devil. A devil. She, she consults with familiar spirits. She hangs out with New Age mystics. She is a devil. Don't believe everybody that says the name Jesus. Don't believe everybody. They're not talking about your Jesus. They're talking about the Jesus of like this movie, and they're, ta they're, they're not talking about the Jesus in the Bible. Do not be fooled by that lady. She is evil. I could show you things about that lady that would make you cringe. But it's fascinating to see such a connection that someone has to the world of the occult and then try to present a so-called gospel message. That's exactly what Roma Downey and her husband are indeed doing, presenting another gospel, another Jesus. Roma has consistently stated in past and current interviews that she is on a spiritual journey. 
She doesn't say she's born again, or she's saved, or God saved her soul, or Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior. What does she say? I'm on a spiritual journey. It's New Age mystic talk. That's, that's all it is. It's New Age. It's mystic talk. That's what it is. It's equally interesting to note that Roma is close friends with Della Reese, the famed singer and actress, as well as founder and pastor of the Church of Universal Foundation for Better Living. Folks, there's too many people taking their theology from these people. They're, they're allowing these people to teach them things on their shows, on their TV shows, and their television, and they're influencing them. They're influencing their ideas. They're influencing what they, what, what they do. They're programming them. That's right. That's exactly what they're doing. <clears throat> it is also important to note that when one goes to Mrs. Reese's church, Miss Reese's church, its tenets has nothing to do with sin, for the concept of original sin is not accepted, nor is the concept that man is initially a sinner, which needs a savior. For all men are God's children, even the worst individual. So there's no need for repentance. There's that dirty word. Yet the word, yet the word disputes this notion. And Jenny, you know, he goes on to, to show you Bible verses. Obviously, you guys understand all that. Uh, that is the agenda. Okay, anyway. So let's see here. Mark, uh, let's see. Uh, Roma, as well as Downey's husband, Mark, and uh, Della Reese, who influenced Roma, as well as Downey's husband, Mark, into seeking another gospel, yet keeping some connections to their Catholic teaching, the combination between another Christ found in Catholicism and the addition of a New Age spiritualism in a combination that seeks to do one thing, produce another gospel entirely. That is the agenda of those like Mrs. Downey and her husband, and the mere fact that Jim Baker, a Pentecostal minister who began his life preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but now supports and embraces the new gospel. Only cements the belief that the Apostle Paul warned about. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This new gospel which is being presented is what, what, what's what we've been warned, warning about for a long time. I, I've been warning about this for a long time, that they're, that they're pushing a new gospel. They're pushing a, a, a new thing. Anyway, so that's a little bit of a background. Okay, that's a little bit of background on, on who that lady is. Now you're going to see it bleed through as we, as we look at this movie, The Son of God, as I show you some things about it, and you understand it. Uh, you understand a little better. Now, I want to read you a Bible verse here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 23. That if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And why don't they deceive us? Because we have this. And we divide it, what they say, we rightly divide it with this. And we see everything through the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation. So we see it and we understand it. And when we're made known of things, we separate from those devils. And we have no company with them. That's sharp language. It sure is. It's going to get a whole lot sharper as we keep moving. Because these people are devils. These peoples have a devil gospel. They're pushing a devil gospel. That is not Christ that's on that screen. That does not represent who Jesus Christ is. And I will absolutely prove that today. By the way, Joel Osteen was a major advisor for this film. He was on set for it. That ought to make you feel real good inside. Old smiley face devil himself. That guy, I'm telling you, he's a great motivational speaker. I mean, he's, he's a great motivational speaker, but he is a heretic. He is a new age. He is a prophet of the new, new world order. He is a prophet of the new world religion. We're going to get to him in a few weeks, though. Not now. I don't have time to cover him. Old Smiley, we're going we're gonna to knock that smile off his face through the Word of God here in the weeks to come. Not literally, not literally, not physically, spiritually. All right. Let's first look at churches, though, that are yoking with this. What are these churches doing? What's, what's going on with, the, with, this, with this outreach and these churches that are, that are yoking up with, with, um, with these people? Why are they doing it? What's the reason? Why are they all, why, why this push for this movie? You know, why this absolute diabolical push for this movie? 
Out of anything, they, they want this movie pushed so bad. So what's going on here? Well, you've got men like, you've got Rick Warren that rents out, that's pushing this and has rented out whole movie theaters in the area. You've got Joel Olstein that said a, a, an anonymous donor donated uh, to have like, I think they handed out like, and it was thousands and thousands of tickets. Thousands of them. Free. Well, who... Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus that they're pushing? Well, listen, they've even got this packet that you can have here. The official Son of God resources for your church in small groups. Now listen to what they want, to, want you to do here. Why should your church be involved? Well, Son of God is the most evangelistic movie for this generation. It will enable ministry to happen and provides an opportunity to reach people for Christ. Which Christ? Which one? The false one? The one that will arise? The one that's to come? Yeah, that one. The, he says here, the passion of Christ moved people to experience the death of Jesus. By the way, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. He's not dead, he's risen. Amen. To maximize on his death is to keep people dead. Amen. It's to keep him dead. He's not dead. Amen. It will challenge the unchurched to answer the question, who do you say I am? Not that guy. I can tell you that. Released in 2000 theaters by Fox, this movie, oh, <laughs> good old Fox. Rupert Murdoch and Fox, huh? That's just, that, that's it. That's who, we want to, that's who we want to take our spiritual advice from, a pornographer. It's great. Yep, that's who you want to support. Let's, let's send our dollars over to, to Fox and those other people. Let's give them our money. It's ridiculous. Oh, by the way, Bill Hybels casts the vision for the Son of God. I mean, he, he tells you, Bill Hybels is the, is the father of the emergent church movement. Um, he is the father of the ecumenical movement. Um, I don't have time to go back to where this really goes to, where it starts from. I mean, this ecumenical, well, the ecumenical movement, in essence, was started at Vatican II. But... We're going to cover Vatican II sometime in the future. So you get a good understanding of these prophets of the New Age and where they come from. See, nobody wants to talk about Rome anymore. That's just, I don't know, let's talk about it. You know, I grow weary of preachers that don't want to talk about Rome because Rome is still the mother of all harlots, the abominable one, the harlot, the whore on the hill. It needs to be addressed. And when preachers don't like to address it, that's really that gets a little nervous. I get a little nervous around preachers like that. Anyway, here's some of the comments. I believe the audience will be enthralled, encouraged, and inspired. Bishop T.D. Jakes. Well, there you go. Roma Downey work is truly unprecedented, says one. Rick Warren says, brilliantly produced with stunning uh, cinematography. you got to go see this movie. It's great. It's wonderful. Nobody's talking about the theology of it. Nobody's talking about the message it's teaching. No, nobody's talking about that. So, so they give you this study guide in these packets, and they want you to, well, listen, church, you, you take from 20th Century Fox, you can take your instructions. And Well, some of these pastors, they need those packets because they can't preach anyway. So they do need some packets and somebody to help them to do that. They, they do need that. Some of them do need that. I understand completely. So they're going to take those packets, and they download most of their sermons off the Internet anyway. So they're, so they're going to they're gonna have, they're gonna have 20th Century Fox do that for them. Great. Take it from Hollywood. Yeah, because I'm telling you what. Hollywood's done such great things for America and the world. But it's done, and these people do it. No, not many people do. Yes, they're selling these like crazy. Oh, and if you think they're not Baptist churches and other churches, they're buying them. And they're using them for study groups. They're using them for their little six-week courses. Why do you need that when you have this to tell you who Jesus is? Why would you need that movie? And why would I need a bunch of New Age mystics to try to tell me who Jesus Christ is? bunch of devils. Why would I want to take my advice from them? It's just wicked is what it is. It's wicked. Absolutely wicked. But nevertheless, that's what they want you to do. And they're, they're offering that and they've partnered with churches. 
These churches have all yoked together. Rick Warren. I mean, there's a list of like 50 of these new evangelical heretics that are all a part of this. And they're all pushing this movie. And I wonder, so what's the spirit behind all of it? We see what the spirit is behind the, the, who, who this uh, lady is and her husband and everything they've done, and they're a bunch of mystics. So knowing that, how in the world could I go watch a movie when I know that it's a New Age Jesus? If there's a New Age mystic that is presenting the film that works with familiar spirits, how could I trust anything they say? Well, well, if one person gets saved, it'll be worth it all. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, you know, Saul had a good. Saul didn't want to want to lose Israel, so he went. He went to a a witch, and he got some advice from her. But I mean, he had good intentions in mind. He just didn't want to lose Israel. He wanted Israel to win, and he couldn't hear from God, so he went to a witch to hear from God. So, in other words, we have a bunch of New Age Sauls here that they're going to go to witches to get their message from God. Do you understand how absolutely twisted that is? And I'm telling you, on my Facebook page, I see these people that were saying, hey, I'm taking my whole family to this movie. And I'm like, and I just asked them, well, why would you do that? What for? <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? Why? Why? Why would you go to that movie? Why? For what reason? Oh, I'm taking the whole family. <sighs> Entertained by devils. By the way, let me say this to you, that evangelism is not, is not marketing and acting and movies. Evangelism is not, is not marketing tactics. I know fundamentalism has been full of marketing tactics to market people to come to the house of God, but that's not the reason that, that, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're to be out there preaching the gospel. You're to be witnessing to others in your life and, and, and trying to win people to the Lord and trying to share the gospel with them and teach them the truth about Jesus Christ and who he is with the word of God. Not some marketing scheme. Not, not, not with, uh, come on. Yeah, because 20th Century Fox has my best, Christ's best intentions in mind. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that has nothing to do with, with evangelism. Now, the good question, who do men say that I am? In Mark chapter 8 and verse number 27, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and by the way, he, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. Now, in all this, I've never heard of Jesus' appearance attracting people and making them love him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, read you an article here that was done on this. And uh, not that one. Not that one. Oh, here we go. Here's what's supposed to attract people to this. The hashtag on this, if you're on the internet, if you don't know what hashtag means, maybe you don't know what that means, but it's a, it's a, it's a tag that tags people that people go look at that comment. It's called Hot Jesus. Must Jesus be sexy? I don't mean to be disrespectful, but as I watched the trailer for this new movie, Son of God, I found myself gawking at the actor portraying Jesus. Anybody recognize this spirit? Haven't I told you about this spirit before? We heard this spirit from certain preachers that wrote books. Yeah, books that talked about certain things. Recognize that New Age spirit? Uh, there's another one. Uh, there's a spirit, spirit called Shekinah that they talk about. There's another one. Never looked that up. There's no such thing as a Shekinah glory. 
Okay, Shekinah is a mystic whore. That's not the truth. That's not the Bible. It's a false spirit. You won't find Shekinah anywhere in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere in any in, in, in any Greek or Hebrew or anything like that, but you will find it in the Kabbalah because that's where it comes from. So next time your preacher says that, don't listen to that. Next time you hear an Internet preacher say that, don't listen to that. That's false. That's not. God doesn't have a female deity with a female name that's his glory. God doesn't need a female deity. God is complete and whole and within himself. So do not believe that that cloud that came over was called the Shekinah glory because it was not called that. That came from the Kabbalah. That did not come from Jesus Christ. It did not come from the Word of God. You can't find it in Hebrew or English or anything like that. In any, of the, in any translation like that, that was all made up. Okay, so there you go, just so you understand that. But anyway, this is that same spirit. Pastor Joey Foss calls it the spirit of porno mysticism. It's an interesting title, but this is not new. It's been around for a long time. This is this spirit that this God is my boyfriend spirit. You understand what I'm saying? There's books that are written out there there's, that allude to this. This God is my boyfriend type spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I'm not going to get graphic. I'm not going to be crude. I'm just telling you that's what it is, and that's what it's pushing. That's what it's pushing. Diego Diago Morgado is one is one hot dude. His Jesus looks more like Brad Pitt than the nice man with the beard in all those paintings. We're going to talk about the nice man with the beard next hour. Who is the nice man with the beard? He's not a nice man. That picture that's depicted of who Jesus is, I'm going to show you where that really comes from. And it's not new. It goes all the way back. And it's not one culture. It's all of them. It's a mystic Jesus. Not him, though. Okay, anyway, I'm not the, anyway, I'm not the only one gawking at Morgado. I'm reading this article. I'm not talking about me, okay? So, you know, <laughs> I'm not the only one gawking at Morgado's Jesus. He inspired the hashtag, I've already said that, hot Jesus or whatever. I went, I went, it went viral on, on Twitter. The actor told the New York Times he doesn't want his looks to distract from the movie. But if the message of Jesus was love, hope, and compassion, and I can bring that to more people by being, being more appealing Jesus, I'm happy with that. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Clearly, we have a new trend, a more appealing Jesus. Not just a better prophet. We actually don't know what Jesus looked like. We do know he was a carpenter, so perhaps Jesus was buff. Who thinks about this stuff? It's in the mind of a deranged, demonic person to think this up. There's a spirit for it. Yep, there's a spirit for it. But I don't think when the biblical Nathaniel asked, asked Nazareth, can any good thing come from there? And Philip answered, come and see. They were talking about Jesus' beautiful face or chiseled abs. Hmm. Yes, Jesus has portrayed as, the, as in countless paintings... Uh, yes, Je yes, Jesus, as portrayed in countless paintings, has a six-pack a, 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 as a comedian and author Greg Bernhardt uh, joked, I'd like to get ripped like Jesus. Jesus was ripped. You've seen the pictures, right? He's just ripped. He's the son, son of God. He's not going to be walking around, about, around saying, I, I've, I've got back fat today. I'm so puffy. See how deranged these and demonic this is? All joking aside, why must Jesus be that way, or, or ripped, or even handsome? So then he goes on, and a Jesuit explains how some people see him as that, and he's not really that, and I can't stand Jesuits, so I'm not going to read his, what he said. But anyway, um, on the other hand, why wouldn't God create a perfect son? Anything that is like that is, gonna, is going to attract people. People who might not go to the movie might want to check it out. Particularly not Christian, says Reverend Lisa Jenkins. Senior pastor of St. Matthew's Baptist Church in Harlem. 
I don't see a problem with Jesus being attractive giving our, given our cultural context. I don't recall a Jesus who is not appealing to the eye. That's Hollywood. Jenkins is more concerned about what she considers an inaccurate portrayal of Jesus' ethnicity. Wow. Anyway, so obviously it's the looks. And, and then this lady that wrote this article says, I tried to come up with a living person to compare to Jesus. And this, this is what makes me sick. That, of course, is impossible. The closest I can come as a Catholic is Pope Francis. I've grown to revere him. Yeah, Francis. Current devil incarnate, yes. Um, the vicar of hell, yeah. Yeah, I don't mix words when it comes to that. Um, okay. That was interesting. Um, Isaiah 53, 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. How about Acts chapter 17, which blows away this whole image of Christ in the first place that these people are doing? It blows it away completely. Acts chapter 17 and verse number 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You're not to fashion something that you think looks like Christ. You're not supposed to make something. Why? Because the Godhead will not be worshipped by your hands, by something that's made by your hands. God made you, okay? <laughs> you're not going to make him. It doesn't work that way. And when you fashion something and you try to make something out to be God or out to be Jesus Christ, it's idolatry and it's wickedness. And it's a false, it's a false God. It's not Christ. This is that false Christ that is being preached. This is, that, this is that image of Christ. Where did it come from? We're going to talk about that the next hour. Where did this image of Christ, this long-haired, hippie-looking, uh, now this um, you know, uh, playboy that, they, that they're making Christ out to be in this movie? This is, that's what they're doing. I mean, this guy, he's there for that appeal. He's there for that reason. That's what they're doing. That's, that's the whole purpose of it. Well, now another theme of the movie is this, did, that Jesus came to change the world. No, he didn't. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible that Jesus came to change the world. That's not true. No. One of the main, that's one of the major themes. Jesus asked Peter in this movie uh, to go fishing. It's the other way around. When Jesus came to the, and I'm talking about the movie, that is. When the movie Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee, rather than call his four disciples, his first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, he only calls one disciple, Peter. But rather than call Peter, oh, I wonder why. It's made by Catholics. Oh, I wonder why that happened. Um, right? Oh, that wasn't an accident. That one was hard to figure out, wasn't it? But, but, but rather than call Peter and Andrew from their boat while they were fishing, Jesus pleads, Peter, just give me an hour. And I'll give you a whole new life. That screams of Joel Olstein right there. In fact, Joel Olstein was, I watched a little video of him talking about this scene. That's why I know this is him. This is, this is, I, I, you can, you can just, you can just, you can see the, and hear the hiss of a serpent with that. You can just hear it. I'll give you a whole new life. After sassing Jesus, Peter takes him fishing, where Jesus works a miracle and provides with him an abundance of fish. When Peter asks what they are going to do, Jesus says, change the world. In the real Bible, Jesus doesn't beg anyone to spend time with him. After all, he's the Lord, and he commands his Peter and Andrew, the apostles, you know, the disciples to come. Immediately they leave their nets and they follow him, right? Remember that? He wasn't begging them. Hey, Peter, just give me an hour, will you, buddy? Just give me an hour and I'll change your world. 
Sounds like a game show host. Just spin the wheel, Pete, and see what happens. Spin the wheel, Peter. That's all you got to do. Just as the apostles were, co were commissioned by Christ to go into all the world and make disciples, he didn't tell anyone that he came to, he didn't, he didn't tell anyone. You can't find one place in the Bible where it says, I came to change the world. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit, Jesus said, This is why he came. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pre preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's why he came. John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 2 Corinthians 5.16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We were never to be attracted to his flesh. But the work of God that he did, he, wasn't, he was not here to boost humanity. That's what the Antichrist is coming for. He is coming to boost humanity. He is going to come and fix man's human problems. He's going to fix their flesh and make it perfect so they can live forever. So they will be like God's. The promise that he gave Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Satan wants to fulfill that promise for mankind. He wants to perfect the flesh. But the flesh can't be perfected. It's cursed. It'll be made new one day through Christ Jesus. Behold, I make all things new. And by the way, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. That's why he came. He came because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And we are just nothing but sin. And he came to save us from it. Amen? He didn't come to make you a better person or make the world better. He came to give you life, to quicken you who were dead in trespasses and sins. 1 John 3, 8. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. The world will not be changed. It's evil. And Satan is the god of this world. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So he came to change it? No, he said, they hate me. The world hates Christ. If you were, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word I sa that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. I have manifested thy name unto the, unto the men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, they believed that thou didst sent me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all are mine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am come no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy, and have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word in the world that hath hated them, because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. Oh, I'm sorry, John chapter 17. I'm sorry about that. John chapter 17, verse number 17. We read in actually 12 through there. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 
Right, they think so. By the way, in this movie, another fatal error of this movie and a false teaching of this movie, there are 13 disciples. The number 13 is a woman. Mary, that follows Jesus around. And she's everywhere. And Mary, this Mary, she actually, she actually corrects the men when they don't have enough faith. But I thought it was interesting that that number 13, <laughs> that number 13, do you know what that number 13 stands for, don't you? Rebellion. Jesus had 12. 13. And the number 13 here would be the rebellious one. And it's a woman. <laughs> why, did they, why did they add this woman in? What's the point? Now, I personally believe they're doing it for a purpose because the way that they show this woman with Jesus and how she does everything, I think they're trying to get at something. I think they're pushing a New Age Da Vinci Code type agenda is what I think is really going on with that. I think that's to leave some thought into your mind. Because why would these men be traveling around with this woman by herself alone? Thirteen men, fourteen with Jesus traveling around with this, or twelve men, thirteen with Jesus traveling around with this woman alone? I mean, ladies, you... You ain't going to travel around with 12 guys. Right? I mean, besides being disgusted by all the gross things they do most of the time, you're not going to be traveling around with, with 12 guys. Right? It's just not going to happen. It's not normal. So why here? Yes, you read it right in the Scriptures. There are only 12 disciples. But in the film, there are 13 disciples, and the 13th disciple is a woman named Mary. Not only is she always with them, but she's with them in the boat during the storm when Jesus walks on water. She's with them when they travel privately through the scriptures, though in the scriptures, Jesus pulled aside and taught only his 12 men. Mary is also very outspoken and often reproves the male disciples to have more faith. During the crucifixion scene when Jesus is being jeered at by the crowds, Mary defends Jesus and shouts, Leave him be. I mean, I'm sure that's what a woman would say. <laughs> but, but the point is that it's not, it's not biblical. The, the Bible doesn't say that. Braver than the male disciples who never speak up or do anything heroic or faithful, then when Jesus is resurrected, she's the first and only woman to enter the empty tomb. She also accompanies Peter and John, who later come to the empty tomb to see for themselves. In Scripture, three women go to the tomb early in the morning and are greeted by angels who remind him that Jesus said he would rise on the third day. In the movie, then she and the disciples remember all this on their own. In this unbiblical portrayal of the true Son of God, while the fake Jesus and his disciples are walking through a crowd, Mary just happens to see Martha weeping and asks her what's wrong. When Martha says that Lazarus has died, the movie Jesus arrives at the tomb. He actually goes in with Martha. Then he touches Lazarus, whose face is not wrapped, gently cradles his head, weeps, and kisses the back of Lazarus' head. No, in the back, actually. I was checking for that. It braces, and the three of them emerge from the tomb. Actually, wait wait a minute here. Quotes, he quotes some scripture and then gently suggests that Lazarus arise. Come on, Lazarus, get up. Come on, buddy, wake up. Wake up, bud. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Martha, Martha and Lazarus embrace, and the three of them emerge from the tomb as the crowd cheers. They didn't cheer. They wanted to kill him. The Pharisees and all of them were like, let's kill him. Let's kill him. This scene was performed like, more like football players exiting a tunnel and, and onto their home field than truly a majestic and awesome scene that is depicted in Scripture. 
Now, this is the one that's the kicker here, one of the kickers here. I think this is a, yeah, this, this one is really, okay. Jesus talks, the movie Jesus talks Judas into betraying him. Yeah. In this movie, Jesus is never shown humbling himself and serving the disciples as one of the lowliest servants in a household. But he doesn't have to, have to, since throughout the film, the Lord is depicted as more of our buddy than our glorious master and king. So here the Lord is shown laughing and enjoying this meal with his disciples. Like he was, that wasn't what was going on. That didn't happen. It was a very somber, sobering, uh, he was vexed in the spirit. So here the Lord is shown laughing and enjoying himself, enjoying this meal and his disciples. Then suddenly he has a vision being betrayed by Judas. Like he was surprised, like it wasn't going to happen. Then pretended Jesus had a look on it of, of surprise and defeated sadness as he tells the disciples for the first time that he's going to be betrayed, suffer, and die. Though in scriptures the Lord foretold his suffering and death three times prior. He told them, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of his enemies there. After Jesus has this surprising and upsetting vision of Judas betraying him, he turns to Judas and convinces Judas to betray him. Now listen to this. With tears, Judas admittedly refuses. Adamantly refuses. Adamantly, sorry. Adamantly refuses. But Jesus endearingly holds Judas' face. <laughs> wow. Then gently and lovingly insists that Judas do it and do it quickly. Reluctantly, Judas does as Jesus says. In this false ad adaptation, the other disciples are aware of Judas' betrayal, and Peter tries to stop him, but Jesus tells Peter to let him go. That didn't happen either. By the way, in the movie, Jesus never mentions the just penalty of sin or that we need to be made into new cre creatures through repentance and faith in Christ, which alone equips us to go forth into all the world and make disciples. There's a great omission of that commission. It's not in there. Not converts to a new way or a better world or just a happier, more peaceful life. A utopia. Now, another thing that happened. They ended up casting Satan out of the movie. So Satan does not appear in the movie at all. Now the Bible, ad, the Bible, the 11 hour Bible series had Satan in it and he looked like Barack Obama. I mean, he was like the spitting image of Obama. He looked exactly like him. So, so they didn't want that to be a distraction, they said. So they omitted Satan from the movie. Now, how do you have a movie about Jesus Christ redeeming the world, redeeming his, his, his people and come to die for the sins of the whole world? How do you do that and leave Satan out of the movie? Well, here's the logic behind it, I guess. Son of God opened in cinemas Amer across America this weekend, but minus the Bible's most cunning, controversial, and diabolical character. No, Judas Iscariot is in the movie. It's the evil one himself, known reciprocally as Satan or Lucifer, the devil, who has lost his iconic role. Satan's fall from stardom gives rise to rumor. Where did he go and why? Can it be there is more important role to play and offer more lucrative, or has the unimaginable come to pass? Is Satan dead? The film's executive producer, Roma Downey, and her husband, Mark Burnett, are not ducking the swirling questions concerning the villain's swift departure. Irish-born Downey, who also plays Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the film, recently told USA Today, it gives me great pleasure to tell you that the devil is on the cutting room floor. This is now a movie about Jesus, the Son of God, and the devil gets no more screen time, no more dist distractions. Downey and Downey's intent is hardly vague. I wanted all the focus to be on Jesus. I wanted names to be on the lips of everyone who sees the movie, so we cast Satan out. You can't change the Bible and call this a movie about Jesus Christ. You cannot do that. But you have Christians everywhere, or professing Christians anyway, that are going to fill their churches up and support that movie. Ah, 
Satan, as the Bible story goes, made his cameo appearance in the Garden of Eden, proving himself to be a master of improv and one-liners. It's hard to envision the full drama of the gospel without his him. His absence is such a sizable jump cut in the original storyline. It's not likely, however, that the evil one is still lying about on the cutting room floor, grieving over his ouster from the Son of God. He's been around since the beginning, since time began, and he knows how to survive the fall. Satan's precipitous descent in the Bible is far more dramatic. The words of Jesus Christ attest to the climatic day and are found in the Gospel of Luke. Anyway, so this person goes on to say how bad it was for them to do what they did and to take, take Satan completely out of the movie. So why would you do a movie depicting Jesus overcoming the world and then you leave out Satan, leave out the adversary? Let me ask you, should Christians be supporting Hollywood's false Bible movies? Even if the movie was had a true account to it, should we really be supporting it? Should we be propping these people up that are used to fund a sodomite movement completely? A movement that is anti-Christ? How many, how many, how many hundreds of movies does Fox, does Fox uh, create that are, that are anti-Christ? If one was okay. Tons of them, so we help them do it. Rick Warren says it was brilliantly produced with stunning uh, cinematography. Not since The Passion of Christ ten years ago have I been this excited about a movie. So the high priest of the one world religion there, the man that sang Purple Haze on stage, at his church, the man that is a part of Chrislam, the man that shakes hands with the Pope, kisses the pinky finger. My, 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 the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Mark Driscoll, that pimping preacher, uh, he says this, uh, he says, by the way, he has that same spirit that talks about all that fornication, all that stuff all the time. If you ever heard some of the things that that man has said. Their, their Roma Downing and Mark Burnett work is truly unprecedented. In the history of the church, I am happy to work with them to make the most of this incredible opportunity to share the gospel in this unique, impactful way. He's a pervert. I believe the audience is, will be enthralled, encouraged, and inspired, says Bishop T.D. Jakes. The Bible tells us to love not the world. The Bible tells us to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, to abstain from all appearances of evil. The greatest tragedy of all this is the support of Hollywood who destroys the moral fabric of society. We must not support Hollywood. We must not support it by handing out dollars over to them. Watch depictions of Christ in the Bible that are false. We must separate the holy from the profane. We can't accept that garbage. We just can't. Can't be a part of it. We, we've got to separate from this. I mean, there's so much more that could be said, but I think that nails it enough. I think it has enough strikes to it that people should not want to go watch that movie at all. We'll pick up the next hour here in a few minutes and we'll talk about uh, where that image of Christ comes from, that long-haired hippie image. And we're going to show you that. I'm going to show you some pictures, actually, and show you some things and give you some history. A lot, lot, of, lot of facts today. Uh, so it will be a lot, of, a lot of information to go home with, but you can re-listen to these again and you can equip others with this. You can be equipped to go out and talk to others when your family members know say, hey, let's all go see the Son of God movie. You can tell them why. Or you could just send them the link to the sermon and they could be mad at me and not you. Because I'm used to that anyway. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We pray you'd bless us. Pray, Lord, that people would heed this warning as even it goes online to others to hear. Lord, stay away from this wicked New Age Jesus that's being pushed. It's another gospel, another Christ, and let it be accursed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.